I do not ride elevators all day, but I just love elevators. Here's the thing, elevators in Italy are a little bit different than most of the elevators that I've ridden in America. But any modern elevator that's run on computers and algorithms, it's way smarter than you. They have AI in there, they're like optimistically, depending on the time of day, sending the elevator to the right place. Some of them use facial recognition cameras to count the number of people that are waiting for the elevator. So if you're in an advanced elevator, don't worry about it. If you're in an Airbnb in Italy, then I think it's very polite. <laughs>
invents this in 1853, um, or 1852. In 1853, we get the first elevator shaft, but no elevator yet. Um, this is a guy named Peter Cooper, also in New York City. Um, if you know the area, Cooper Union, Astor Place, he's around there. And this is his building. It's called the Peter Cooper Foundation. And he knew about elevators, and he wanted to build an elevator into his building, but the elevators weren't ready yet. They weren't you know, being produced yet. And so he built this round shaft into his building, and it goes all the way through the building. Uh, and when the building was completed, there was no elevator. It was just empty. And if you notice, the elevator shaft is round. Um, who's ever been in a round elevator before? A couple people. Most elevators are square, though. What's, what's the deal with that? Nobody knew what, what shape elevators were going to be, so he just assumed they were going to be round. Um, and so when the elevator was then invented, they put a square elevator inside this round hole. Uh, and it was like that for 120 years until they renovated the building in 1970. And then they put a round elevator in the round hole, and that's the elevator that's uh, in that building today. So that building is still, still there. 1853 passes. We get to 1857. This is the first real elevator, also in New York. Um, this is what it looked like back then. This is what it looks like today. This is in Soho. And uh, again, this building is still there. You can still ride in these elevators. They're the first installed elevators in the world. Um, and so that's in 1857. So our friend Peter Cooper was like, four years early in installing his elevator shaft. Um, how do we control elevators, right? It's 1850s. There's no computers. There's not even really any relays. There's no transistors. There's nothing like that. We use people. Um, this is called an elevator operator. And they have a control. And uh, pushing one way makes the elevator go up. Pushing the other way makes the elevator go down. Um, and actually, I did used to live in a building in New York City where the freight elevator for the uh, goods and, and stuff that would come from the basement, that was actually powered like this. And you would literally crank it, and it would go up. And it was a lot of fun to ride. Um, but these are not super safe anymore, and we don't want to pay elevator operators. So we don't do this anymore. Um, but the elevator operator had a lot of skill. And it was their job to, for example, make sure the elevator was on perfect level. Um, a really, really talented elevator operator would always make sure that the elevator was right on the floor so you could walk or roll off. Um, if you weren't so good, you had to adjust it after the fact. Um, later, uh, automatic floor leveling gets invented. Uh, and so you have to think every single detail of the elevator that you take for granted today had to be invented. It didn't exist in the beginning. And so uh, we have these elevator operators. Um, but people wanted to automate the elevators. They, they didn't want to have people inside there. That's one less passenger you can carry. It's one more person you have to pay. So the first attempt was a scheduled elevator. So this is like a bus. Basically, you want to go to the 10th floor, you know there's an elevator going to the 10th floor um, at 3.10 PM, and you would get there at the right time, and you would go up in the elevator. This obviously is no good. Uh, it would be a nightmare if elevators worked like this. Um, when there's nobody in them, they're going to be running empty. When they're waiting for passengers, it's just wasted time. So this is obviously no good. Um, this was around 1924. We still didn't really have the automatic elevator figured out. Um, this didn't really, really take off, um, but eventually, uh, we got electromechanical elevators. And so these are run on relays, which are kind of like a transistor, but really big. And you can encode the algorithm into the hardware of the relays. And so that's what we did. So we built the elevator algorithm in these relays. And uh, they were quite complicated. They were quite big also. Um, and as with everything else, uh, the relay over time um, gets replaced with the microprocessor. Every relay becomes a transistor and eventually becomes a general purpose computer. And we can program it with software, which is what we all do today. And so that's where we are today. We, we write software. Um, elevators can be updated by a technician showing up. They, some of them can even be updated over the internet. So they're actually part of the internet of things, which is you know, not great. Um, I have a thermostat in my home. And uh, I'm glad that my elevators uh, aren't as unreliable as my thermostat. Um, yeah, the last thing I want to kind of talk about, about like how the elevator works is you got to test these things. And you can't test it in a building that people are using. And so the companies that make elevators, they actually have testing towers. So this one is a Mitsubishi testing tower. This one's in Japan. Um, and it is uh, 173 meters tall, pretty big. This one's even bigger, 248 meters tall in China. This is a Thyssenkrupp elevator tower. And what I love about these is that they're always in industrial areas. So everything's flat. It's all warehouses and factories except for one huge building, because they need to be able to test really, really tall elevators. And so uh, they'll have eight or 16 elevators in here. They'll be able to test different algorithms, different weights, different materials. 
Um, and so this is how they test the algorithms of the elevator. Um, that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is these algorithms. Um, the algorithms are what make the elevator run, and they're what I'm really, really interested in. Uh, if you are also interested in them, this is the book for you. This is the Elevator Traffic Handbook. Um, this is a real book. I read it. It's really good. It's not really good. Um, it's, it's really interesting, and there's like all kinds of detailed graphs and Poisson distributions and equations of like how things work. And so understanding a lot of the concepts of the, uh, that are in this book are how you would design, let's say you're an architect, you want to design a building, you need to know how many elevators. This book has the equation. You put everything into it, and you get out. You need three elevators. Uh, so this book is really cool. We are going to be um, talking a lot of, about a lot of the concepts um, in this book, but we're going to be doing it through a Swifty lens, because after all, this is Swift Heroes. So um, what does an elevator algorithm look like? Well, we could look at the elevator algorithm. Um, this is basically how every elevator works. Um, this is how everyone expects an elevator to work. We'll talk about more advanced stuff, but pretty much um, the idea was sort of written down by Donald Knuth in his book, The Art of, uh, Elev uh, the Art of Elevator Programming, The Art of Computer Programming. Um, and there's two basic rules. Uh, keep going in the direction you're going until you have nothing to do in that direction. And uh, the only time you need to stop is if somebody wants to get off or somebody wants to get on who is going in the same direction. So this is the elevator algorithm. This is the starting point for how basically every elevator works. Um, one fun fact is that this is actually also used in hard drives. So in a hard drive, you have a head that seeks over a disk. And instead of going back and forth all the time, it keeps going in the direction that it's going in until there's no more reads in that direction. And then it kind of sweeps back the other way and reads in that direction. And that's been found to be a very efficient way to run a um, hard drive. So same algorithm, different context. Um, we're going to look at some Swift code. There's actually going to be a lot of Swift code. Uh, but we're going to walk through everything step by step. Um, and it's going to be great. Uh, I like to start with really basic primitives. Um, you know, instead of using a Boolean for the direction, we're going to use a proper enum. Uh, really simple, you're either going up or you're going down. Um, to initialize the enum, a little helper, uh, given a floor that you're coming from and a floor that you're going to, uh, let's just you know, assign the correct uh, direction to the, uh, to the enum in the initializer. Um, from there, there's a couple more helpers on uh, direction that we need. Uh, I have a lot of helpers. I'm a big helpers guy. Uh, I wrote, had a whole talk about it. Uh, it was called You Deserve Nice Things. And so I'm all about like building up the small components into the big components. So you're going to see a lot of that here. Um, our uh, direction, we want a way to get a multiplier out of it so that we can tell the elevator to go up or down, positive or negative. And so up is going to be positive, and down is going to be negative. Um, and then one more helper here is we want a quick way to be able to flip the elevator. And that's if it's up, it's going down. If it's down, it's going up. So that just mutates the enum. Um, after we've dealt with the concept of direction, which everyone's familiar with, we're going to talk about the concept of calls, which maybe not everyone's familiar with. There are two kinds of calls in an elevator. There's a hall call, which is when you get to the elevator bay and you push the up or down button. Um, and that tells the elevator to come pick you up. And then there's the car call. And that's when you pick a specific floor that you want to go through, not just a direction that you want to travel in. And so these are the two types of calls that we need to model. And so we're going to keep it super simple. Your the kind of your calls are either going to be a hall call or a car call. And then you've got a floor that you're coming from and a floor that you're going to. Uh, again, with the helpers. This one just gives us the direction using the direction initializer we made earlier. Um, this one gives you the destination of the elevator. Now, you might expect the destination is just always the two field, uh, but this is actually the destination from the perspective of the elevator. So uh, if it's a hall call, the destination is actually the floor that the elevator is going to pick you up at. And if it's a car call, then it's the destination that the elevator is going to drop you off at. So this is just a helper for the elevator to know where to go to pick up that particular passenger. Um, last helper here is just a quick way to have someone board the elevator. We're going to be simulating an elevator. And so each of these calls represents a person. And when a person gets on the elevator, they basically transition to a car call from a hall call. So if they're a hall call, then convert them into a car call. Um, with that, we're ready to start writing some guts. Um, this is what I'm calling an elevator dispatcher. And that's going to be the thing that actually controls the elevator going up and down. Um, an elevator dispatcher needs to know how many floors are available. It needs to know who's in the queue. That's people who are waiting in the hall and people who are in the cars. Um, it's got a direction. It's either going up or down. Um, it has a floor position, so it's, it knows where it is. This is going to be part of our simulation. 
Um, and then we can just initialize by uh, setting up the number of floors and then kicking off our loop function. And so again, simula simulation, so we're gonna be kind of running through this loop over time and deciding what to do. For now, the loop is just gonna be a while loop. It's just gonna spin infinitely. And then this tick method is just going to sleep for 16 milliseconds. So we're gonna update every 60 hertz, basically. Uh, so tick doesn't do anything, it just sleeps so that the animation looks nice. Um, helpers, we're doing more helpers again. Okay, uh, am I at this floor? So we just need to check if the floor that I wanna be at is the same as the floor position. Uh, are there calls above the elevator? Um, for that, we're gonna check if there is anybody in the queue who wants to go uh, to a floor that's above us. Calls below the elevator, same exact deal, except we flip the inequality. Um, are there calls in the current direction? So we're gonna use both of those things that we just made and the direction that we're going in, and we say if we're going up, then check if there's people above us that are waiting, and if we're going down, check if there's people below us. Straightforward. Um, yes, so more helpers. Passengers, who are the passengers? Well, they're the people who are in the car. So anybody who's a car call in the elevator, that's a passenger. Um, are there any passengers to alight? Um, alight is a British word, so for American audiences, I have to explain it means get off the elevator. Um, but I think this is a somewhat European audience, so this may be a word that you're familiar with. Um, but American English doesn't have a good word for like get off the elevator, so I've stolen the British one. And that's also what the book uses, I think, because the authors are British. So if there's any, uh, the way we know if there's anybody who wants to alight at that floor is we basically check if there's anybody whose destination is, uh, who's in the car and their destination is where we're at currently. Um, yeah, so and then we wanna check if there's anybody who um, wants to either get on or get off at our floor. And again, we're gonna check our queue and we wanna check if we're at the passenger's destination, which is where they would kind of transfer, and if they're going in the same direction as us. So that going in the same direction as us is very important. You would, if you're on the third floor going to the fifth floor, you would not get on a downward going elevator. Um, great, so let's talk about the simulation a little bit. We want a way to be able to board passengers. So if we're at their floor, we wanna get them onto the elevator. So what does that look like? Um, we're gonna loop through the indices of our queue of the people that are in the elevator. The reason we use the indices is because um, we are going to be mutating this array, so we need some kind of handle to be able to mutate it. Um, and so we grab the item at that index. Uh, we wanna make sure that it's a hall call, because those are the people who are boarding. We wanna make sure that we're at the floor that they're coming from, and we wanna make sure they're going in the same direction as us. And if that's all the case, then we can just board them. Very straightforward. Um, Similarly, we, we're boarding passengers, we also need to alight passengers. Um, for that, we reverse through the array this time because we're gonna be removing items from this. And so when we remove it, we don't wanna mess up the other indexes, so we're just gonna go in reverse order. Again, grab the call, um, check if it's a car call. Uh, that means they're in the elevator, check if we're at the right floor, and if we are, just take them out of the queue, they're out of the simulation, and we don't care about them anymore. They've gotten to their final destination. Uh, and that's all the helpers, so we can now build our algorithm, which is exciting. So they've given us a little bit of space to do that here. Um, first we check, where, where, are we at a floor? If we're at a floor, are, is there anybody who wants to get on or off here? And if there is, then we open and close the doors. This again in our simulation is just a little delay um, to simulate the idea that the doors are opening, uh, and then the people get on or off, they board or, or alight, and then the doors close again. Um, it's very important to alight first and then board later. This is not only good etiquette, but it also makes sense. The first time I gave this talk, I had those in backwards order and someone came through, they were like, is that right? <laughs> and I was like, that's not right. So you wanna make sure to alight first and board later. Um, after we've dealt with the people who wanna get on and off, then um, we need to figure out if we need to keep going in the direction that we're going. So if we have calls in our current direction, then we need to move. And so moving is just adjusting the floor position um, by some amount in the direction that we're going. Uh, the amount I've chosen here is 0.1, so this is um, one-tenth of a floor per tick. So you can imagine every sixth of a second you're moving one floor. You could change this to change the speed of the elevator, uh, but it's just something that worked nicely. Um, on the other hand, if we don't have calls in the current direction, but we do have calls, that means they're in the other direction, which means we need to flip, and so we need to go down. And if there's nobody in the queue, then we don't need to do anything. We just stay where we are. And so that's the elevator algorithm. Yeah, you can applaud now. No, don't applaud, don't applaud, don't applaud. Uh, you want to see the simulation? Nobody cares about the code. Let's see the, let's see the elevator. There it is. All right. So as you can see, it's picking people up, dropping them off. It'll pass by people who are not in the right direction. So you saw on the fourth floor there, it passed by someone who wanted to go down because it was going up. 
and uh, it's working out great. Um, now, the big question here is what kind of traffic is this, right? Now we're going to get it back into the guts and the theory of this. Um, this is a special kind of traffic. The people are spawning at random floors, and they're getting off at random floors. Now, that's possible, and that does happen in the real world. Um, but it's actually not really that important for elevator designers. And so this is from the book. Um, there are two concepts called up peak and down peak. And so they represent, through the course of a day, in a commercial elevator, uh, what happens. And what happens is in the morning, everybody gets there, and they're in the lobby, and they need to go up to the floor that they work at. So there's a huge spike of people going up. And then there's a little bit of interfloor traffic, which is what we just looked at. And then there's a little spike of people going out for lunch, people coming back in from lunch. And then at the end of the day, everybody leaves. And that's the down peak. So we've got the up peak and the down peak. Um, we can keep working with our simulation and uh, simulate what up peak looks like. And so with the up peak simulation, people spawn mostly on the lobby floor, uh, sometimes on other floors as well. Um, and you can see that you know, people come and the elevator basically just keeps going to the lobby to pick people up. One thing you'll notice is that the elevator just picks up eight people at once. Uh, it'll have to pick up like 9, 10, 11 people. It just picks up 11 people. Uh, this isn't necessarily realistic because we didn't program any capacity uh, into our elevator. So our elevator can just pick up infinity people. Um, so that's not good. Let's, let's throw in a little bit of capacity in here. So to do that, our dispatcher needs to know how many people it can hold. For the uh, simulation, I just picked five. And it's going to be another property in the um, initializer that we need to set. Um, another helper has capacity. This is just if there's fewer people than the capacity in the elevator. Um, then here, when people are boarding, we need to just make sure that the elevator has capacity before we let them board. Um, and there's a little bit of complicated logic here, because now, if somebody wants to get off, you got to open the doors. But if somebody wants to get on, you only want to open the doors if there's space to let them on. And so this little goofy Boolean situation handles that. So if there is capacity or somebody wants to get off, then we open the doors. But if there's no capacity and nobody wants to get off, even if there's somebody waiting, we're not going to open the doors. We're going to go right past you. Uh, and here's the simulation with the capacity. So this is, again, an up-peak simulation. So this is the morning. People are going up to their offices. And as you can see, people are stacking up in the lobby. Uh, but we can't pick up everybody anymore. So we've got you know, 11 people waiting, but we can only pick up five people. So that is not good. Um, we can also look at the down-peak simulation. It's going to have similar problems. Down peak is um, because everybody's spawning on a random floor and they're all going to the lobby. Uh, you can see that the elevator zooms past everybody going down who want to go down, and they pick, it picks up people from the top floors first. And what that means is that people who are right above the lobby kind of uh, don't get to get on the elevator. So they just keep stacking up and stacking up. And so this also is a real, uh, is a real problem. So up peak and down peak are the real situations that we need to design for. So, what do we do about up peak and down peak? There's a couple tricks you can do. You can just wait for those periods to end, and you'll eventually get everybody. You can, um, you can write algorithms that like, make sure to go to the first floor to get those people if they've been waiting too long. But really, the problem is that our building is too big, and we're under-provisioned with one elevator. So what our simulation is telling us is that we need more elevators. And so we're going to code up multiple elevators. Let's go. Um, so we have our single elevator dispatcher. We're going to break this up into two objects. One is going to, these are the properties of the elevator. Those are going to move to an elevator class. And then our single elevator dispatcher becomes a multi-elevator dispatcher. It really only needs to keep the number of floors and an array of elevators. So that's really all it needs. Uh, and then we're also going to split the calls. Instead of having a queue, we're going to have just the hall calls. And that's the dispatcher is going to know about those. And then the uh, elevator is going to know who's in the elevator at that moment. Um, last thing I want to call attention to is this line. This line is a great shame. Okay. It makes the code really easy to read. I probably wouldn't write this in real life. Uh, strong coupling, unowned, force unwrap, like uh, implicit unwrapped optional. This is, you know, is going to come back and bite you. But for the sake of the demo, uh, I just want the elevators to be able to easily access their parents so that they can do their, their, um, do their, do their actions and, and figure out what they need to do. So this is basically the separation of our elevator and our, um, our dispatcher. So from there, we need to kind of tweak our uh, different uh, helpers. Uh, first thing we need to do is we don't have a queue anymore, so that queue is gone. So we're just going to replace that with the hall calls. So this is who wants to board. It's the people that are in the hall. Uh, this stuff all stays the same. And we just want to remove the passenger from uh, the hall calls when they board the elevator, because they're not in the hall anymore. 
uh, and then we'll just add them to the um, we'll add them to that specific elevator. So that's good. And then uh, these um, these helpers, these guys all talk to the queue. The queue doesn't exist anymore, so we just replace it with the car calls plus this elevator's car calls. Those are the people that that elevator's interested in. Uh, and then this is our uh, kind of the body of our simulation. This doesn't change at all because we have those helpers. Uh, we don't actually need to change a single line here. Um, demo time. Let's simulate it. So this is multiple elevators, and this is an up-peak simulation. And as you can see, our two elevators are able to keep up with the traffic, and they're able to take everybody to the floors that they want to go to. So that is a great success, uh, multiple elevators in Swift. Um, kind of wrapping up here, uh, this is a game. Um, unfortunately, you have to write it in JavaScript, which is not good. Um, this isn't JavaScript Heroes. This is Swift Heroes. Uh, and this game basically lets you write an algorithm for these elevators to solve these challenges. It's a lot of fun. It's really cool. I'm bad at it because I'm bad at JavaScript, again, with the JavaScript. But uh, it is a cool game, and there's lots of challenges, and, and you can do all kinds of really custom stuff in there. And it's really, really interesting to play. Um, and kind of to close out, I'm going to leave you with a uh, building with 10 elevators and five different floors, all animating. And I'm going to say thank you. <laughs>